it has been a week. I've been mommying the past couple of days solo as my hubby is in London for work. My parents are back in Vancouver, a place that I'll be flying to in just 20 days for a much needed family vacation to introduce my beautiful baby girl to all my friends and family back home. This is the first time that I'm taking her to the place that I was born and raised. She was born here in Italy. She finally got her passport and we are ready to go and meet some friends and family. Her name's Ariana, but we call her Ari. She's the sweetest angel and has been an incredible baby. She rarely cries and she sleeps almost through the night, minus a couple wake ups here and there to eat and do her thing. So a couple days ago, something was off. She wasn't sleeping like her usual self. She was crying every time I laid her down, even if I was just changing a quick, quick diaper, which to me was very odd. She'd get very upset, very agitated. We thought that it was sleep regression. She's now seven months. So that's kind of the spot where things could be happening. She's trying to walk. She's trying to walk on her own. She walks with my, holding my hands, walking around the kitchen. So I thought, oh, maybe she's sore. There's all these things going through my sleepless mind. And I'm like, what could make her change up on a dime like this? And then I saw the ear tug. She did it quite a lot. I hadn't focused on it before. And yet there it was. She was telling me what was wrong. She was telling me what was going on that made her a completely different baby for the past week or so. I immediately took her to the pediatric emergency where they confirmed that, yes, she has an ear infection. So it's been kind of rough. We've had to give her all these meds. She's been in so much pain. I've not been able to tell her what's going on because she's at that age where, like, you try, but they don't really understand. I've been crying alongside her as she cries because my usually sweet girl clearly looked like something was wrong. And yet I had no answers in the moment. She suffered for a couple nights. I felt like I had bailed her for not realizing what it was sooner. And in a way, I look at Brock Purdy's concussion on Monday against the Vikings as something similar. He suffered a head hit in the tush push situation. And after that, he played like a completely different quarterback. Almost like he wasn't the same dude at all. And I saw people victory lapping this on how average he is, going on their Twitters, resharing videos of content that they had made about how, you know, he needs his star players around him in order to shine. They all had no idea about the concussion because this news just came out. And for me, these two situations, they're kind of similar. My daughter's ear infection, my favorite team's quarterback's head injury, caused a shift in character that made both of them very different than their typical selves. And I felt a sense of relief when I found out that there is a solid reason, not excuse, but a reason for why both weren't acting and playing like who they truly, who they truly are. And yes, I'm comparing my daughter's ear infection to football, but that's what I'm stuck in right now. My little girl has this tiny little ear infection that has completely derailed our whole week, just like that Monday night football loss to the Vikings. The high from the 5-0 and start of the season has now left me in shambles. Looking at this 5-2 and record, I at least have a little bit of hope that when the team is at full health, they can be that feeding monster we once knew. Just like my daughter will sleep through the night again, she already is doing better with the meds. Thank fucking God. Now, looking at this weekend, we've got a doozy back in the bay. If Purdy does not pass concussion protocol, it'll be Mr. Seeing Ghost himself, Sam Darnold, leading the system quarterback train and welcoming Joey B in Cincinnati. It's Bengals Week, baby! Let's go! What's up, y'all? It's your Chrissy, and this is Crystal Ball, and a weekly show in which I preview the 49ers schedule by interviewing an analyst from the opposing team with a sprinkle of spicy start and sit suggestions for your fantasy lineups too. Now, today, we did not get into the spicy start and sit suggestions for your fantasy lineups. We got into some overrated, underrated players from the Bengals, which I guess you could kind of take as that anyways, although maybe not one of them. Whether you're watching on the tube or listening on Spotify, I appreciate the hell out of you. Let's get into it. The Bengals are 3-3 and on the season after a not-so-great opening act. Joe Burrow got the bag at the kickoff of the season. Seemingly, he has not lived up to the price tag of that, though. However, he's also still recovering from a calf injury, which you could point to for the shaky start. All right, so my next guest knows Burrow and his family pretty well, actually. Steven spent a tailgating afternoon trying to track down Joey B's parents, which she successfully did and had the opportunity to smoke a stogie with them, too. She's the commissioner of Cincinnati and someone I draw inspiration from daily, not only for the badass content she creates, like Ride With Yaz, which puts other betting videos to shame, but also just for her positive positive outlook on her team. Like me, she sees the silver lining in life and seriously is just a beautiful human inside and out. 
Everyone, please give a mini cheer to Commissioner Yaz. Oh my gosh, that was so sweet. (laughs) Thank you. And everything you were saying, your daughter was like hyping me up too, which I absolutely loved. So thank you. Yeah, she's a part of this right now. So I'm sorry, everybody, but like she just no, we love it. Oh, she for whatever reason she's awake, but it's fine. It's like (laughs) it's okay. She's like I'm ready. I also want to hear what they have to talk about. This is a big game. Exactly. See, she's trying to talk too. Um, Kate, thank you yeah, so I much, first off, for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's like kind of nuts. I'm like over here almost at like 12 a.m. my time. So I don't, is it like you 6 know, p.m. Insane. over for you? Oh, yes. <laughs> but it's like the end of the work day for me. For you, it's really like tomorrow already. So I like hats off to you. That is incredible work ethic. <laughs> Dude, it's I'm on maternity leave, so I can do this whenever. I'm all good. And like she likes yeah. to be awake whenever, so it's fine. But okay, let's dig right into this because I the last time I talked to you, we were both just like you coached me through something I was gonna do for the game day, which is crazy. And like it's so great to see you now again. So thank you again. Um, you've been bouncing around all these different states all the time. I never know where you are. So can you tell us where you've actually grown up? Yes. So this is actually funny. I grew up in Northern California. Um, Almost my entire family is 49ers fans on my mom's side. And then on my dad's side, they're more Raiders fans. But we were very, very close to Candlestick and Levi's Stadium. And so growing up, me liking the Bengals was a very, very funny thing and problematic thing because everybody was like, no, you're supposed to be with us. But Um, Yeah, I grew up in California originally, and then I was traveling a lot for the last two years um, with a company called The Game Day, doing a show called Ride With Yaz, which is where I'm in different states every weekend. And at that point in time, I moved to Dallas because I always had my layovers there. And one day I was just like, I should move here. Like, I'm always here. I've never actually been here, but I'm always in this airport. So I picked up and moved to Dallas like very quickly and absolutely loved it. It was one of my favorite places ever. And now I live in New Jersey. So I slowly (laughs) went from the West Coast to the East Coast. Amazing. And how exactly did you even become a Bengals fan? So, I became a Bengals fan because of my brother-in-law, Michael. He's been with my sister since I was like six years old, like my entire life. I'm 28 now, so I've known him forever. He is actually a huge 49ers fan, but he used to watch the Bengals because of Marvin Jones, especially Chad Ochocinco. He just like took a liking to the team, even though he was a Niners fan. He just used to like like watching Chad and his craziness, like his crazy touchdown antics and stuff like that. And I always knew I loved sports growing up, but nobody really ever entertained me except for Michael. He would let me watch the games with him. He would talk to me about football, teach me things. And so as I was growing up, I started seeing the Bengals and I love it because of Chad. So I think it was in 2009, the Raiders and the Bengals were playing each other and my sister and her boyfriend at the time were like, we have a surprise for you. We're taking you to the Bengals and Raiders game. And so we made like iron on shirts with Chad's name on the back and like his number, the Bengals logo, because you can't find Bengals stuff anywhere in California, at least at the time you couldn't. We like ironed it all on. And then we went to the game and I tweeted it at him and we got to meet him. It was just like this whole crazy thing. And I, yeah, this was so long ago, but Ever since then, I was just like, this is it. I'm a Bengals fan. So I really owe it all to him. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know anything about Cincinnati. I didn't even know where it was. (laughs) But I (laughs) loved him so much. I was like, this is my team. And as the years went on, I just stuck with it. And I'm glad that I did. (laughs) That's so incredible. You know, it's funny. He like tweeted something, you know, about like how he used to take a Viagra or something before games. And I think I commented on it once. And I'm like, oh, like. Like, how hard was that game against whatever? And I was trying to be cheeky. And then he DM'd me and was like, LOL, to my comment. I was like, man, this is great. Yeah, but well, yeah, you get a laugh, good. so that's all that matters. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Love and that. then obviously people know you. I know you as Commissioner Yaz. It's iconic. It's a vibe. How and when did the name come to be? 
So again, going back to my family, which is, this is all funny. Like now that I'm saying it, I'm like, it's all just like in my roots, but my family, all my cousins and uncles have a fantasy football league that they've had forever. It's called the Torres league of league of champions. And it's always been just the guys like uncles and cousins, brother, whatever. And I always wanted to be in it. So every year, like, I think they only did 10 people at first. Like, they were really strict. And then they moved it up to 12. Every year, I'd be like, can I join the league? And they're like, no, dude, you're one, <laughs> like, 16 years old. And two, you're a girl. And three, you're a Bengals fan. Get out of here. And I'm like, can I join the league? Can I join the league? Finally, when I got to college, they did this thing, like, one year where they were like, we have a spot open and you can join our fantasy league. And I was like, Ooh. yes. So I got to join the league. And I think it was after one or two seasons. The way we did it is every year there was a new commissioner. Every year we voted for somebody new. They made me commissioner one year because they're like, okay, you're a girl. You keep us organized. Ooh. And I was like, I got this. This is my time to shine. And ever since I've been the commissioner, they never, we never went back to the new one every year. They kept me it. I've been it for like six seasons maybe and yeah. so when I my Twitter just used to be yo Yasmin and then I realized like people don't really know how to say my name so people can call me Yaz and then one day I was like well my fantasy football league I'm the commissioner so I'm just gonna start calling myself commissioner Yaz and I changed I like my name that. to it and people loved it and it just became a thing I love it you know what now that you say your old name I remember following you when you had that the yo Yasmin that's yeah. funny um, was, okay yeah. So you've obviously been through some shit. Like, I know I, you put some of it out there. Like, not I don't know if anybody knows the extent of it and everything. And, like, I'm even grateful right now that we're able to have this conversation because, like, I saw Thank some of the you. shit that you went through. And I'm like, holy smokes. Like, so grateful you're here. You're in the hospital for a pretty scary situation. Do you want to, like, talk us through what happened, like, the story of everything? Yeah. So... Yeah, I actually haven't been able to talk about this at all since it happened. Like I've tweeted here and there, but I'm like, I don't think people really know because I went from being a full-time content creator since 2020 to then not creating any content at all. So actually, thank you for giving me this platform to kind of tell this story and like let people know what happened. But okay, so back in April of last year, so 2022... I was diagnosed with endocarditis, which is an infection in your heart. Um, and I had gotten that because I had sepsis, which is an infection in your blood. I had sepsis for 16 days, but we thought that it was like a sinus infection. I don't know. Number one thing is always vouch for yourself medically. Sepsis usually can kill people within three days. So I was very, very lucky. And basically what was happening was while I had sepsis, the blood pumping through my heart was infected. So it was like all congregating in my mitral valve and I had endocarditis. I spent weeks in the hospital, did all the antibiotics, all the treatment, eight weeks of treatment. And then I was cleared and I thought I was good. Um, well, come January, 2023, I'm feeling really weird. I'm like, tired all the time, can barely breathe. I have really bad fevers. I'm like, I know something is wrong with me. Went to the doctor multiple times. They couldn't tell me. And then one day I just woke up and I'm like, I was with CJ and I'm like, CJ, I, I just know my body and I know that something is wrong. I need to go to the hospital. Yeah. And we were flying to Arizona that day for the Super Bowl. Oh, um, it was like Sunday. So it was a week prior to the Super Bowl. We were going to be there all week. <laughs> And yes, it gets crazy. Um, I get to the hospital to do blood work and they are like, you have endocarditis again, you're being admitted and you're not leaving. And I was admitted into the hospital in Arizona um, with endocarditis and I was put on the strongest antibiotics that exist um, because it, the infection was so far along. I was put on the strongest antibiotics that exist, but after a few days, my body started to reject it. So they gave me a lower level antibiotic. And after, I think it was like 10 to 12 days, I was released, able to fly home to California, was going to be on watch there, but they were like, okay, go to your family. Was released just to fly home, fly home. I don't even last 24 hours. And then I wake up in the middle of the night to like probably the worst thing of my life. And I'm just like, 
throwing up profusely. I have like this insane feeling in my head. I'm like, what is going on? And so we call 911, they come, take me to the hospital, and I was having a stroke. Oh so my God. What happened was that I was on this medication that was so strong that was containing the endocarditis that when we brought it down to the lower level medication, the infection started to shoot bits and pieces of itself to different parts of my body. So when it shot up to my head, it caused a stroke and a brain bleed. So I was life flighted to a different hospital where I was in the ICU for two and a half weeks. And that time, I honestly don't even remember it. Like, I <laughs> don't even think I was alive. Um, <clears throat> then it was finally February 28th. The dam supposed to get released. And they do one last CT scan just to make sure I'm good, make sure the brain bleed had been, like, absorbed enough to where I could go home. I would still be on medication at home, like with a home nurse, but I at least wouldn't have to be in the hospital anymore. At this point, I spent the entire month of February in the hospital. And that CT scan came back for an aneurysm in my head. So when the brain bleed happened, it hit a blood vessel and the blood vessel was growing. So that causes an aneurysm. So they were like, tomorrow morning, you're going into brain surgery the neurosurgeon is gone and we don't know what procedure he's going to do, but you need to sign these things that give us permission to basically go into your head. So that was insane. The next morning went into it and thankfully, 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 they were able to go in through my thigh or my groin. They went all the way up and they super glued it shut. So the aneurysm is still in my head, but it's super, super glued so that it'll never explode. Um, it's still there and, right now. Yeah. Oh, which is in- insane. And the <laughs> crazy thing is when I woke up, I thought they had like removed it and they were like, oh no, it's there. It's just super glued. I'm like, oh, okay. And then what they did was they cut everything or ar- blood vessels around to make sure that those didn't inflame. And what that did was it caused me to have alien hand on my left hand. So my left hand just didn't work for like oh. two months which was the funniest thing. Like I would pick up my phone and think that I was going to set it on the counter, but like the counter would be here and I would set my phone here. But my like depth perception was so off. I don't know. It was crazy. So that happened. And then I had to stay in the hospital for like a whole nother week. And finally, I think it was around like March 11th, 12th. I was able to go home, was going to continue my care at home. And I lasted, I think, maybe five to seven days before I had to go back to the hospital again because my body was having an allergic reaction to all my medications. So I was back in the hospital and they were like, you know what, like we, your body can't handle this anymore. We need to put you, we need to get you off these medications. So we did a thing where they went internally, looked at my heart to make sure the infection was gone and got me off of everything. Well, I was doing medications through a pick line, which is a thing that goes into your heart. Yeah. And that, when they pulled my pick line out, it left a blood clot in my chest. So the next morning yes. I was ad- admitted back into the hospital for about another week with a blood clot. So at this point I had spent basically all of January sick, February, I was in the hospital and then March all in the hospital. And then finally, like middle March, got to go home, got to finish all my treatment at home. And then in like May, I was cleared. So long, long story short, I'm sorry. That was everything that happened this year. And a lot changes when you go through something like that. And so after that, I went back to Dallas and I was ready to go back to work. I was like, let's do this. I haven't worked since January. I think the Bills game, Bills Bengals game was my last time I worked, which was the very beginning of January. And the week that I was set to go back to work, the company that I worked for laid me off. And it was like the worst time of my entire life. I was like, I literally almost just died. I haven't gotten a paycheck since January and now I don't have a job. And it was like the lowest of low that you could hit. I was there. And so I really just took like June, July and August to figure out like what I was doing with my life and realize like content creation just really isn't something that I am able to do right now. I have so many things mentally that I need to take care of. 
but it's been so fun to kind of be on the other side and just like be able to give people advice and cheer others on. And I know that so many people on my platform are confused. Like what happened? People blame it on my boyfriend and they're like, oh, she's just not a Bengals fan anymore. But it's like, no, really? I just went through one of the most traumatic things that anybody could go through. And I don't have the energy to put myself out there the way I used to, you know? Right. So, yeah. That's my story. <laughs> Dude, I know. And that's something that I don't think people understand. Like I've even experienced in my own ways, you know, when you, when you're putting yourself out there as authentic as we can be, it's still a lot. It still takes a toll on you. It's it's still like a lot of your mentals putting, because yeah. I personally, I don't like to do these kind of things unless I'm feeling good, you know? And so like, yeah. you know, when there are bad days, you're like, no, no, no. And some people don't understand that. And some companies don't get it. And it's not fair. It's not right. But you know what, in the long run, like you understand why things didn't go a certain way and like you look back and right. you're kind of like okay I'm happy that that didn't work out because now look where I am right so right. I'm sure that that's how it's going to be for you and I'm really glad and, and grateful that again you're here and you're able to share this story with us because like I'm, there's other people that go through this shit and it's scary and like the fact that you're alive is amazing like thank god thank god right. I don't thank know and you. so like you're in that hospital bed obviously you're there for a long time what was, was there anything that you can think of that kind of got you through those days that you were sitting there thinking like, when am I going to get out of here? Yeah. Hmm. That's a good question. I feel like really one of the biggest things was the support that I had, like my friends and family <clears throat> and my boyfriend at the time he wasn't my boyfriend, but my boyfriend, um, yeah. I think like, yeah, it was just all the support. And I was hesitant about posting it online, but I was like, at that point, you know, you post something online and people are like, oh, she's asking for sympathy. But I really wasn't at all. I literally was like, I don't know if I'm going to ever be able to tweet again. So I'm just going to tell people what's going on. And I didn't even tell everybody the extent of everything happening. It was like, I think I tweeted once, like I'm missing all the Super Bowl stuff because I haven't done endocarditis. And then I think after the stroke, I tweeted saying like, please send your prayers. And the craziest thing is that I actually would lose my phones for days at a time because I was just like so out of it mentally. But I went back a few weeks ago and I was reading all the responses that I had gotten to some of the tweets and I was a puddle. I was sobbing because Aww. I didn't realize how much support I had and I felt it. I just at the time wasn't in the right headspace to be able to read and respond to all of those. And, mm. but I really do think it was just the support of everybody, like the way that everybody came to my like rescue and was like talking me through everything. I remember the morning of my surgery, all my best friends were, um, FaceTiming me, like just hyping me up. We were like li listening to my favorite songs in the hospital room, like just trying to like get me like excited about this surgery I was about to have. But yeah, I would just really say it's like the friends and the company that you have. Amazing. Oh, I'm so glad that they were there for you for that. And that's yeah. also, yeah. I mean, like you look at some of the DMS every now and then you get DMS that you're like, ugh. But then there's other right. ones like I've experienced such amazing ones that you don't even realize in that moment how much you needed it. And then you look back and you're like, wow, like it's really great to have this support, even from people that don't even know us. Right. Exactly. So, OK, let's talk a little bit about the journey of where you are now. Yeah. Okay. Hey, babies, you're OK. Um, <laughs> you've done some incredible things. Ride with Yaz was one of my favorite segments. I'm not going to lie. But you. what out of all the things that you've done, what was the most meaningful project to you like that you were a part of? Oh, that is a good question. I think really the community that I built on Twitter, like Ride With Yaz was incredible. It was so fun. But what I don't know if a lot of people know or not, it really wasn't for a long time. It wasn't centered around Cincinnati. Like I would fight with the game day and bet Fred <laughs> constantly to please send me to Cincinnati, which is hilarious now. I'm saying this because now that I'm not employed by either, they used to tell me no, no, no to going to Cincinnati, no to going to Cincinnati. Now... Now, Betfred has this huge partnership with the Bengals, all this stuff, and good for them. But I'm like, really? Because I was trying to go there. You Ironic. <laughs> yeah. But um, I would say, like, yeah, Ride With Yaz was so fun. I met so many amazing people. I got to travel to so many stadiums. I am 
in debt to the game day and bet Fred for giving me those opportunities that I really wouldn't have had. Um, but I think my like most meaningful thing has just really been the community that I built on Twitter. Um, although like there are the trolls and the meanies that come, I feel like I have such a strong friendship with so many people on there that I've never even met before, but like, I'll see their username. I see their profile picture and I know exactly who they are. And I think that I purposely watered that grass for so long because I knew I'm living in California and I'm living in Dallas and I'm a Bengals fan. Nobody understands it. If I'm going to feel like I'm actually integrated in this community, I need to put in the work. And I think that, yeah, my biggest accomplishment or most meaningful thing is just like the community that I have on there. I feel that honestly, because, okay, I I'm from Canada, I'm from Vancouver. And so I'm living in Italy now. I rarely go to 49ers games, but like everyone I talk to online, they're like, yeah, you're from the Bay, aren't you? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I've never even, (laughs) never, like I've been there for vacations. I've never lived there, never anything. And everyone gets it mixed up. They're like, you must be from there. You're such a big fan. I'm like, no, I'm allowed to be a fan, even though I don't live there. Like it's fine, right? So yeah, the community is amazing. And you do feel like even when you're not able to go to those games, that you're there because you have those people, you know, and you have those, like, I can picture the faces too. I know exactly what you're saying. So that's pretty amazing. So I guess like how of all the people that you've been able to chat with, like in all the different interviews that you've done, is there one that maybe stands out to you? Hmm. I think, well, I, you mentioned this earlier, but the Burroughs, um, I, yes. I feel like some people are probably like, what is she talking about? Um, there is an episode of Ride With Yaz where my whole like premise goal of the show was to go find um, Joe Burrow's parents. And it really started off as a joke. Like I didn't think that I was actually going to go find them, but I do have friends. His girlfriend is one of my friends. And I asked her like, just straight up, I'm like, do you think that you could introduce me to them? And she was like, yeah, they won't mind at all. And I got to talk to them and it was really awesome in the video. It's just literally for the video, but after and before, like when the cameras were off, we actually got to chat and then we got to see them again um, after what game it was the Kansas city game right before the super bowl. And we saw them after at yard house and it, they were really friendly again and like remembered me and stuff. And I think like that was just a really cool moment. Um, another one I would say is Chad Ochocinco. I've gotten to meet him again one more time and that was this past year in December and it was funny because I wasn't it was at a bar called the Holy Grail in Cincinnati and I wasn't there but people kept DMing me like he's here he's here you need to come meet him you need to come because they all knew that he was the reason I became a fan so I and I was going eventually so I showed up and everybody was like yes yes go talk to him I'm like I can't I'm scared (laughs) but I did end up getting to like say hello I didn't want to be a fan girl so it was yeah it was a funny like quick exchange but it was just a moment when like everything came full circle like having other people be like he's here like go and knowing how important and meaningful that was to me was special so those are two that were really cool I'd love that. If you could go, this is something I like to ask my guests. I ask every single person. Okay. If you could go for a beer. Now, you've already met a bunch of players and everything, but current or former player of the Bengals, if you could go for a beer or a drink or anything, any drink of your choice with somebody, who would it be? Oh, I don't know. Um, okay. So, yeah, like you mentioned, I do know like a good amount of players just like through friends and building friendships and like relationships and stuff, but hmm, former or current, I think it sounds so cliche and he's so like, I've heard he's really quiet, but I think one would be Joe Burrow. I've heard a lot about how he's just like such an interesting human being. And I don't even know if he drinks beer, but I just think it would be, that would be one not like in a fangirl type of way, in more of a like, he's so interesting, cool, calm, and collected at all times that I'm like, I, I need to, I need to like sit across from you and see what the deal is. Okay. I think, yeah, I think my first answer is Joe Burrow. And my second answer is going to be 
Can I say CJ? CJ, my boyfriend, yeah. he is a former Bengals player. <laughs> oh, I like that. That's a good one, actually. Yeah. Um, oh, somebody that I will say 100%, like this is, I mean, you said player, but like the first person that came to my head before Joe Burrow was our defensive coordinator, Luan Arumo. Oh, yeah. I am like one of his biggest fans, and I think he is just an absolute mastermind at what he does I would absolutely love to get a beer with him and just be like yeah you're awesome <laughs> dude I feel that way about Robert Sala so I'm kind of oh, jealous really? that, okay. that CJ's playing for him now because like he yeah. was our defensive coordinator and I fucking yeah. loved him he has like seven kids like he's just this insane so he's just amazing he seems like the coolest dude ever he's got so yeah. much fire in him He's somebody that I would love to just sit and just have a beer with, like smoke a right. joint with. Like, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. He does seem really cool. I'll admit that. He gives off like cool dude vibes for sure. Kind but of yeah, daddy vibes. Answers, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, my answers are Lou Rumo and Joe Burrow. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. And yeah. you've obviously been to a lot of games. Which one is the most memorable one that you've been to? Is there a reason why too? Oh my gosh. So many. Um, I would say, yeah, I have been to a good amount, which is sad because this season I haven't been to a lot, but soon, um, I would (laughs) say the 2021 to 2022 season, like going to the Super Bowl that season, I might have my numbers wrong, but it was the AFC championship game to go to the Super Bowl. And then the game against the Titans in Nashville before that, because wait, no, this is all a lie. It was the game against the Raiders. That was our first playoff win before those games. But I will say all three of those were just like absolute bliss back to back. Like it was amazing but Jermaine Pratt which is one of the guys on defense had a amazing beautiful interception of Derek Carr to end the game and oh, send us it. Or it was our first playoff win in like 30 years um yeah. and that was one of the most memorable games I'm like I cried at that game and then I'm like oh I also cried at the Titans game oh, I also <laughs> cried at the AFC championship I'm like okay so all of those <laughs> I love it yeah. my dad he, he's a big Raiders fan he calls Derek Carr Derek Carbage like oh he never God. liked him. He was so happy that they got rid of them. Then obviously they've got Jimmy G now, which like yeah. Jimmy was my guy. And I'm like choked that he's over there, but it right. is what it is. That, that okay. is a little funny swap. It is great. My, I bought him a jersey because I even said, I'm like, dad, if Jimmy, if he's cleared to play on the team, I'm buying you a jersey because I already have a jersey. Like I bought her a little thing that has his jersey. Like we all so have to cute. wear the jersey. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Jimmy obviously got cleared to play for them. So it is what it is. I've said my goodbyes to him, but at least my dad is now like, I'm living through him, you know, right. He's a big fan. So it's all good. Um, okay. You touched on this a little bit and I want to ask you about it because, you know, as females, we, we get destroyed for things when we shouldn't even be having to talk about this shit. But I have right. to ask because a lot of people, like, obviously you're dating CJ, yes. but your loyalty is with the Bengals and people question that all the time. I've seen you even have to defend that. If yes. there's a message that you have for those kind of people that are saying, you know, like, are you still a Bengals fan? Are you like, are you going to go cheer for the Jets now? Like da, 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 da. What, what kind of message do you have for people that are trying to diminish your fandom just because of something like that? Right. Yeah. That has been very, very interesting. And it's something funny that I think people don't understand is one, I met CJ when he was playing for the Bengals. We dated for the first time when he was playing, like our first date was in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Like we, so it's funny now that people are like, Oh, how dare you? I'm like, but he came from there. Like, <laughs> what are you even saying? But anyway, um, I think, yeah, two things about that is I think people don't really understand that you are able to separate things. Like I, it's very separate for me. I've been a loyal Bengals fan since I was 13 years old and I know so much about their history. I have spent thousands upon thousands of dollars going to Cincinnati, going to games, going hotels, food, all that stuff while you're there. Like I have spent so much of my money and time on their merch, like so many things. I feel like I have invested so much of myself into Cincinnati 
And just because CJ plays for the Jets, that doesn't all get erased. Like, I still am a Bengals fan. I want to see them do well. The reasons why I became a fan of the Bengals, like, hasn't changed. And I think people don't understand that you're able to separate the two. Like, I want CJ to do well because I want him to come home happy. I want him to be healthy. I want him to be okay. But as long as the Jets and the Bengals aren't playing each other, I don't see why it's an issue if – I'm rooting for his well-being. I like honestly don't know much about like the Jets history. I don't know like really anything about them. I really just like pay attention to CJ and kind of like what he does and says. And I think that people might think like our relationship, like our relationship is very much like I support him and I want As his team be. to do well, but yeah. I'm not like a Jets fan. I didn't go out and buy a bunch of like Jets merch or anything like that. And something that I've been very, very cautious of is like, I have worn a, J- a Jets jersey that's CJ's jersey. But besides that, I've only worn CJ stuff. Like I've gotten everything I've worn custom made. <laughs> I wear like CJ things. I got a t-shirt made of like all these pictures of him and the designer put the Jets logo right in the middle. And I was like, can you take the Jets logo off? I ordered a shirt from a company in Cincinnati that does like vintage rework stuff. And they were like, do you want us to make you a CJ one? And I was like, yeah, can you get his number on there? Can you take the Jets logo off? Like I'm very strategic on all of it. And it's because I want people to know, like, no, I'm not just a jump and ship, but it is frustrating because I'm like, you guys have followed me for years and years And I thought that by now you would know my character, but it's, I understand why from the outside looking in, people are like, oh, she's a Jets fan now. Like all of a sudden this season, I'm not at every Bengals game and I am at the Jets game. Well, I live in Florham Park. I'm in Jersey. I get a free ticket to the game because my boyfriend plays on the team. I'm not going to stay home and sit on the couch when I can go (laughs) to the game and support him, you know? And I would love to be in Cincinnati every weekend, but I'm not traveling as much because of my health. And I am thousands of dollars in debt to many hospitals. If you spend three months, I saw that that's insane. Yeah, You spend three months in a hospital, your bills are going to be out of this world. So I don't have the means that I used to, to be able to just like hop up and go to Cincinnati. My first year, I just put everything on credit cards, which probably wasn't a good idea. And then the second year that I was going to all the games was for work. And so now I understand why people are like, oh, all of a sudden she's not creating content. She's at Jets games. She's not in Cincinnati, but it's like, well, you don't know everything I've gone through. You don't really understand. But I guess my message to them would just be like, no, I'm still very much a Bengals fan. Um, somebody did ask my, our friend Jack asked me and CJ one day. They were like, Oh, so the Jets and the Bengals get to the AFC championship game. Who are you rooting for? Yes. And I was like, the Bengals? What do you mean? Yes. And CJ was like, are you kidding me? And we got into a fake fight and it was funny, but he knows, like, I moved into this house with five boxes of Bengals clothes. Like, he understands. <laughs> and, And you know what? He played in Cincinnati for eight years, I think, seven or eight years. I inherited a lot of Cincinnati merch. So jokes on all the haters because I got a lot of cool stuff. Dude, I love it. Okay, so now we're going to flip to the game because obviously that's why I have you on here. We've got the 49ers versus the Bengals in the Bay. Your guys, they kind of started off a bit shaky. And I'm not going to lie, my guys have been a bit shaky. So like we're, you know, probably feeling the same way. But What's your honest opinion about your guys' team right now? (sighs) We're on the up and up. Um, Yes, we (laughs) definitely started shaky. And that was tough because I think in the offseason, we all were like, this is our year. Like, you know, you have that Super Bowl window, I feel like, when you're a team. And the window is getting smaller and smaller. And I was like, "This this is it. This is the year. And we lost some like really important players. Von Bell, Jesse Bates were two pieces that I was so sad to lose, but I was like, we can do it. Like the new guys are going to step up. We got this. And then (laughs) Burrow gets hurt again. And it's like every season right before like camp, something happens. And it sucks because it's like, when are we going to have the team start strong? So that was tough. 
But right now, I would say I'm optimistic of word on the street, or I mean, word on the street because of Burrow said it himself in a press conference is he's feeling 100%. He's feeling his best and healthy right now. So I can only hope that it's all up from here. But yeah. I have spent a lot of weeks telling everybody the 49ers are the best team in the league. And now I'm like, I don't want to face the 49ers. <laughs> I'm like, stay. Bye. <laughs> Dude, but you guys are facing us at a per- probably perfect time. Purdy just got a concussion. Like we're having right. some of our own woes. Like the defense was not playing, you know, the way that we think that they should be playing. Last week they let over 400 yards, which is nuts to the Vikings. Like the Vikings, I thought right. were frauds. They're obviously not. I I rescind that statement. But I feel like yeah. this is a game that like it could go either way. Sam Darnold's probably going to get the start. I've never yeah. been a fan of his. Like he used to play for the Jets too. Nobody's ever really wanted him as a starter. So. I don't know. Right. You guys have a great team. Like we started three and four last season. We ended up in the NFC championship game almost, or we did. Right. So, I mean, you never know, right? Yeah. I think my biggest thing is I'm always like devil's advocate a little bit. So I'm like, you guys are coming off of two losses and then yeah, Brock Purdy isn't in, but Sam Darnold, like it gives him the perfect opportunity to do a really funny thing. And that's just like, come play a really good game. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, like I feel like we're kind of playing like a little bit of a like pissed off Niners team. Like you guys started so strong. And then the last two games have kind of dropped the ball a little bit. And I feel like the team is going to be like, uh-uh, this is our get right game. Meanwhile, yeah. we're like, I don't, I just, I don't know if I want to play an angry Niners team, but <laughs> whether it's Purdy, whether it's Sam Darnold, I know that Purdy went into concussion protocol, but then I saw that he was practicing today. So I'm like, what is going on here? You guys are trying to throw us off. I'm not a yeah. fan of this. <laughs> Kyle Shanahan has some weird shit going on in his head always, and you never know what you're right. going to get. But yeah, no, I if I'm pretty, I don't play this game. If I have a concussion, I saw the hit and I'm like, no, no, no. You don't want to risk getting that yes. even further. There's bad things that happen if you play with a concussion like that's not gone yet. So yeah. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I, you know, the Bengals for me have never been that team that I'm like, oh, fuck the Bengals. Like, I'm not like right. that. I have that with like the Seahawks. Cowboys, you know, there's all the division rivals. Bengals, I'm like, oh, I like, I really like them because of you. So, like, no matter what, whatever happens in this game, I'm just happy as long as the guys come out healthy. Like that for me, right. you just want to get them healthy. If we go into the bye week and we still have like more wins than losses, I'm happy with that. So, anyways, looking at I guess the roster for you guys, is there somebody that you're looking at and you're like, you know what, I wish that this guy was doing a little bit more? Yes. Yes, I would say T Higgins. Um, but I don't I don't mean it like in a negative way. I just feel like so he didn't start the season as strong. And I think I wish I'm like, I wish he was doing more because I know his potential. I've seen his crazy catches, his moments when he comes in clutch, his spirit, the way that he is. Like I <clears throat> I like feel so bad for him because he's kind of started the season off Rocky. I feel like it started kind of with him and Burrow. Well, I feel like it kind of started with his contract negotiations are happening right now. We don't really know what's going to happen right. with him. And that probably is like a cloud over his head a little bit. You know, he's probably feeling the pressure. Like I need to continue to play good or this is messing with my money. And then like his values going up and down, depending on how every game goes. And then on top of that, I felt like him and Burrow just weren't really on the same page in the beginning of the season. And that could have a lot to do with them not having training camp together, them not having a preseason game together. But it was just like, it was so evident that they were just on different pages. And then he had a rib injury. So I just feel bad. I feel like he's had like one speed bump after another. And I just really hope that this bye week did him well. And that like, again, he can just pick up and go get him because he does have a lot of potential and I want to see him get a good contract and I want to see him do well. And when he plays well, it opens up our our offense. So (laughs) T I have him on a couple fantasy leagues. So like, I'm, I'm hoping for my sake too, with those guys, like please, please do something because I'm, I'm losing in a couple leagues and I'm like, this shouldn't happen. Like where's T where, what's he doing? So I feel you on that. On the flip, is there somebody that you feel like is not getting the recognition that they deserve? Um, so I feel like Bengals fans are like really tapped in with our team, right? Like we all like give praise where praise is due. Um, I would say Trey Hendrickson, he is our defensive end and he, I was looking at stats 
on Twitter the other day. And he's like one of the, I think he's tied for second in sack leaders in the NFL through week six. And he has more sacks than some teams have with everybody combined, which is insane. And I think that people don't like people that aren't Bengals fans don't recognize that he's really good at his position. He's one of the top edge rushers in the NFL. And um, I think that as the season goes on, hopefully people will realize, but that's definitely one that I think Bengals fans give him praise, but I don't think the rest of the league realizes. Mm, yes. That's a, that's a name I didn't know. So thank you. I yeah. I'm going to keep an eye out for him. <laughs> and then a- what are your three keys to getting the dove against San Francisco this weekend? And honestly, I don't think it's going to be that hard. I know you think that you're getting an angry Niners group, but like, I just feel like they're disheveled right now. I feel like, you know, like just the uh, coming off the game that the, this past Monday, I feel like it's going to be rough for us. So for you, what do you think that they need to do the Bengals in order to get the win against San Francisco? Yeah. So something funny that you just said that is, I remember the last time that we played you guys two seasons ago, we lost by a field goal and, or by three points in overtime. And that crushed me. But oh. one of the things was that we were not able to contain Kittle at all that game. And so I think a big key to victory will be for our defense to start strong. They have started like some games really strong and they dip down or they start really like we're kind of like, hello, are you guys awake? And then they pick back up later, but it's like, I need them to start strong and continue that throughout the entire game. Um, I would say containing Kittle, but also containing CMC. Obviously he is just a monster in himself. Um, So I would just say like defense playing well is very, very important. And having a plan for Kittle is something that I hope that they have. Um, so that would be my first one, which I know was like three points in itself, but you get the point. <laughs> um, and then I would say the next one is hopefully just Burrow being accurate. He has looked a little off here and there, and there's so many reasons for that. You know, he's having to adjust his game because of an injury, but I'm just hoping that he is able to come out looking good and I would like for them to get the run game going early. So then Burrow has the opportunity to be like, okay, what are my options? What are we doing? Cause I have a feeling you guys are going to try to stop Jamar chase. So we need to have those yeah. other options. And then I would say my last thing is just for Zach, our head coach to just play a smart game. Um, something like losing a game by three points the last time to you guys. I think we are one of the top teams in the NFL that loses games by a field goal. And I would say just really putting ourselves in situations where we're not losing games by three points. So just playing a smart game. I I say that Zach, it's so interesting because at the beginning of every season, he's always just like such a vanilla play caller and he kind of like gets better as the season goes on. But it, But then at the beginning of the next season, it's the same thing. And it's like, Zach, what's happening here? So I just hope that the offense kind of during this bye week gets a a new playbook. We get something spicy and fun, like open, open up the receivers, you know, do something. So I would just say play a smart game to not have us in a position losing by three points. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And honestly, like, I don't know what you're going to get from us this weekend. I know CMC still got a little bit of a tear in his oblique too. So he might be able to contain him. He didn't do much last week or on Monday. So we'll see how it goes. And I'm excited for the game, regardless how it goes. Like, obviously it's all love with us. So don't worry. Like if you see me going off about anything on Twitter, it's more just like how I am. It's my like Twitter persona. So yes, don't worry. I know. Yeah. With you, it's always, it's all love. So don't worry. Okay. So lastly, I like to end off on just kind of an inspirational question. And like, you've done, you've said so much already that I feel like a lot of people that watch this will get something from. So if you could go back, I know, you've been through so much. If you could go back and talk to your younger self and kind of just like give yourself advice, a little yes, and just be like, you know what, like to prepare yourself to what's to come in the future. What would you say to yourself? Oh, that is a good question. Um, one of like my favorite quotes or just like not quotes. I, I, one of my favorite concepts is just like, um, basically like the idea of like the sun is always going to rise again. Like 
it may be like the end of the world today, but tomorrow the sun's going to rise again. And when I was sick the first time and dealing with everything, I kept telling myself that like, tomorrow the sun's going to rise again. We're going to start over. We're going to get another chance. And then when we got, when I got sick this time, it was the same thing. And I think like my advice to just like my younger self and anybody really doing this is just really like, you are going to run into hiccups and sometimes things are going to feel like they're the end of the world and everything is crumbling. But like tomorrow you're going to get another opportunity and like tomorrow you get another chance. And what I mean by that is just really like tomorrow you get a new opportunity to readjust and approach this problem from a different way. I'm not saying the problem's necessarily going to go away, but maybe tomorrow you're going to have a different mindset to be able to go at it again. And I think like my younger self would be so proud of me. Like just, I was such a crazy little Bengals fan and all the opportunities I've gotten have been absolutely surreal. Like my parents are probably two people that always tell me they're like, we cannot believe it. Like I used to beg them. One time I started a GoFundMe so that I could go to Cincinnati. Like how embarrassing is that? I was in high school asking my family to pay for my GoFundMe for me to go to Cincinnati. Like, oh my God. And then the fact that it turned into my job for two years, I'm just so blessed. And I think like, really, I would just tell my younger self, like there's the sun is always going to rise again. Like you're always going to get that other opportunity. So that is something. And then I would just really tell everybody like content creator wise, or like anybody that spends a lot of time on the internet, just Mm -hmm. like always remember who you are and what your values are. And if you ever feel like your voice stops sounding like you, like you find yourself fighting with people too much, or like, you're just like doing things that you're like, this isn't me. Just like take a step back, take a step back and just like really reevaluate because if your voice stops sounding like you, you need to just be quiet for a little bit and it'll come back. So that's kind of my advice for everybody on the internet. (laughs) Oh, I love that so much. Honestly, I think I needed that last one more than anything because there are so many things that you say yes to or you feel like you need to do, but it doesn't match with like what's inside, you know? And like sometimes you have to take a step back and be like, no, no, this isn't, this isn't me. You know, even if you think, oh, it's, I'm not doing this. All these other people are doing this. Why am I not doing like, no, no, no. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. Do what makes sense for you. Do it your voice is telling you to do. I love that. So thank you. Right, We're all on our own journey. And it sounds so cliche to say like, we all have our own paths, but it, it really is like, that's what sets you apart from other people. Like we don't want to have the same resume as everybody else at the end of the day. You know, that's kind of what makes each person special. So do not doubt yourself when you're doing different things than others. Exactly. Oh, yes. You've been amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. That's all I have for you. Um, seriously, Thank you for sharing everything. I feel absolutely blessed that I'm, you know, someone that you feel comfortable enough to talk about and all the stuff that you've gone through. Like I just, again, I'm so thankful that you're here and I, I just, you. yeah. Where can everybody go and follow you if they yeah. don't already, which they should. <laughs> yeah, that I really appreciate it. This was so fun and I haven't done any sort of like on camera podcast, anything since I got sick. So it was actually really refreshing. And I think this was like the perfect one to ease me into it. So again, thank you for reaching out. Um, yeah. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's just at commissioner. Yes. That's where I post all my bangles tweets. Um, occasionally some Sacramento Kings stuff, because like I said, I grew up in Northern California. So big, um, Sacramento Kings girl. And then on Instagram, it's just at yo Yasmin. My Instagram is really just my personal life. I don't post much about sports on there, but Twitter is where it's at. So come say hello. And I'm always happy to meet new friends. Okay, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in to Crystal Bowen. We've got a buy next week, which I don't know about you guys. I definitely need it. I'm working on getting a very, very special guest. So keep it locked in here. Be sure to subscribe. I appreciate it. I love all you guys. I appreciate the hell out of you all. And as always, we are sending you the good vibes and fantasy wins this season. Peace. Can you do peace? Peace. Bye, peace.